All right, let's get started. Hello, and welcome to Prime Movers Lab technical webinar. I'm Alessandro Levy from Prime Movers Lab, and I will be moderating today's discussion on the autonomous vehicle industry together with my partner, Gaetano Krupi. It's my pleasure to kick off this week's webinar. Today, we're going to talk about the autonomous vehicle industry, latest trends and technologies, and what's going on with uh, safety. For those new to Prime Movers Lab, we are a venture firm focused on breakthrough scientific inventions that have the ability to transform billions of lives across multiple, um, a multitude of industries, such as energy, infrastructure, manufacturing, agriculture, and of course, transportation. Each month, we host webinars to spotlight the growing industries and highlight the amazingly talented people who breathe life into these technologies that we are currently used or we, we will use in the future. At the Prime Movers Lab, we have the pleasure of meeting, investing, and working alongside these brilliant minds every day. And our webinars are a great way for all of you to have the opportunity to engage with them. For those who don't know me, I'm a technical partner here and I've just joined the firm a couple of, couple of months ago. I'm originally from Milan, Italy. My background is electrical engineer and I got, during my PhD, I started developing smart skin for soft robotics. I was a visiting researcher at Stanford Material Science Department and then I started my company, Sam Plus, where we developed touch and force technology for consumer and uh, automotive market. Before I pass the mic to my colleague Gaetano, I just want to go over today's flow and some brief housekeeping items. We are mindful of everyone's time, so we will keep this discussion to one hour. Myself and my colleague will ask our panelists some questions before opening it up to all of you to ask questions in the last 15 minutes. You can ask questions by adding them to the chat box and we will read them aloud. Okay, now I'm going to pass the mic to my colleague Gaetano for a quick introduction. Thanks, Alessandro. As you can tell from Gaetano and Alessandro, you got the Italians uh, this afternoon, at least Eastern Standard Time. Um, I'm Gaetano, I'm a partner at Prime Movers Lab and have been part of the Prime Movers journey from the very beginning as a portfolio CEO prior to becoming an investor. Uh, I'm a serial entrepreneur, originally from Brazil, and my last company was focused on long distance autonomy and how consumer behavior would change um, the way we work, sleep, and play uh, while we're in transport to destinations. My prior companies before that were in fintech and entertainment, um, and before that I worked at Goldman as an investment banker. So I want to turn this over to, to the panelists um, and ask for quick bios. So uh, Nathan and Kevin uh, go ahead and introduce themselves, and I want to have a special thanks for Antonio who is joining us today from Cambridge, UK. So it's a little late for him, so, um, so thanks Antonio for, for, for making time. Uh, Nathan, why don't, uh, why don't you start? Uh, thank you, Gaetan, for the introduction. Uh, my name is Nathan Mentz. I'm the founder and CEO of uh, Spartan Radar, which uh, we're proud to be a portfolio company in PML's Fund 2. Uh, kicked off our seed round in November of last year. Uh, we're working on advanced automotive radar uh, to you know, really help with imaging, imaging radar and uh, what we call multi-mode radar. Uh, my background, I'm a serial entrepreneur as well. This is my second startup. My first startup, uh, Epirus, was in the defense sector and is actually a, uh, a side investment of PML. Uh, they're well on their way with the Series B. Uh, prior to that, I spent 15 years in aerospace uh, as a uh, radar systems engineer for both Raytheon and Boeing, also systems architect. And uh, way back in the day, I graduated from the same department at Stanford as uh, Alessandro, so at uh, material science. So uh, kind of funny where career uh, arcs take us, but uh, thank you very much. Happy to be here. You're on mute. mute. You're on mute. You're on mute. Thank you, Nathan. Uh, <laughs> Kevin, your turn. <laughs> All right, this, I'll, I'll go next. Um, yes. Uh, thanks, thanks for coming to listen to us. Um, I'm Kevin Peterson. I'm currently the head of perception for trucking at Waymo. And uh, before that, I uh, uh, met Gaetano when I was running a company um, that I recently sold to Caterpillar, um, worked on their autonomy for a little while, um, and spent uh, almost the last 20 years working on self-driving cars, so working on the first uh, self-driving cars uh, 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 back at the DARPA Grand Challenges, a um, couple other companies along the way, some spaceships, and, uh, and now trucks. So. Really looking forward to the chat. All right, uh, I'll go next. I also wanted to thank you, all the attendees and then uh, Prime Movers Lab for the invite. Uh, I'm Director of Functional Safety and Cybersecurity for ARM, where uh, we provide 
the processing elements for pretty much every uh, every electronic systems um, in the world. My background is uh, mainly functional safety. I've been doing functional safety for the past 15 years. I've been working in different domains related to uh, oil and gas, uh, railway, automotive, aerospace, as it happens for for five years, and then now um, in AM, where we try and serve all these markets at once, try to make sure that all the safety needs are fulfilled from the bottom. Great, thanks so much. Um, so to kick things off, I mean, obviously the all five of us uh, love autonomy. So myself and Alessandro started autonomy companies um, as well. And so, so we've been deep in the stack for a long time. Um, I'd love to hear from our panelists, what got them interested in autonomy in, in the first place? Um, Kevin, you've you've had a very long journey with it. Some some folks have had more recent journeys, but what really captured your imagination to to start working on this on this problem? Um, so I started uh, actually out of undergrad, uh, and uh, I saw a poster on the wall at Carnegie Mellon that my uh, eventual advisor had posted. It was a dune buggy flying through the air. It had lasers on it, and it said, "Come build this race car." Um, and uh, I was like, yeah, I'll do that. And I got class credit for it. Um, and it turned out that that ended up being the DARPA Grand Challenges. Um, so at the time, you know, we, we, um, we knew it was a big deal, but like, uh, you know, it was this sort of nugget of, of interesting, crazy people who uh, uh, wanted to do something uh, a little different outside of the typical academic world. And um, uh, yeah, that's how I got started. I fell in love with it. Um, I love to see software that actually moves something in the real world. That's, that's the thing that's really enchanted me. And then, um, you know, it's turned into really interesting questions about AI safety um, and how do you actually build a business, which I think we're starting to really answer. Yeah, and everyone loves lasers, right? Everybody um, loves so lasers. I totally, I Not totally everybody, but <laughs> <laughs> we, we do love lasers. Nathan, how about you? Uh, well, you know, uh, coming out of undergrad, I went to work at uh, Raytheon, and uh, their big focus at the time was autonomous sensors, uh, really, because, you know, when it comes to spacecraft and uh, UAVs and stuff like that, uh, there's a quick realization that you can't be in continuous contact uh, with the, the person controlling the vehicle. And so uh, we had been layering in increasing levels of autonomy, uh, starting with you know, kind of the sensor and, and how it manages its its timeline, what it's doing at one particular moment in time or another. And I had the chance to work with some of the really foremost minds in, in uh, what were called a ESA active uh, electronic scan array radars at the time, uh, which went into the, the F-15, the F-18, the planes that won the Cold War, basically. Um, and the, the real advantage they had there is, is when they went from a mechanically steered antenna where they had to really you follow a set pattern all the time, kind of how automotive radars are today, to an AESA where they can really kind of dynamically uh, manage where they're pointing the radar at any time instantaneously. Uh, they had to develop all these additional layers of autonomy and resource management. And so I got to be kind of in the thick as they were adding new and new generations of that. And then when I went to Boeing and we started working on, uh, I worked on uh, air and air missiles and other things like that, that, uh, uh, you really have to be, you, you know, it's fire and forget, right? So the system really has to think for itself and it's against an enemy that doesn't necessarily want to cooperate with you. So that added a whole nother expertise with autonomy. And then um, when we made the decision to found this company, uh, someone who had taught me most of what I know about radar signal processing, Theogenes Abatsoglu, who's one of my co-founders here, came to me and said, hey, I've been working at, um, you know, Garrett Automotive Honeywell for a couple of years now after I retired. And I think the way they're building these arrays is, is wrong and we can do it a lot better. And I think that there's, you know, a real opportunity for some aerospace thinking to really upgrade a lot of the sensor systems they have in this space. And I said, okay, well, you know, let, let's see what we can do here. And, and as I kind of peeled back the onion, I realized how nascent the technology is in this area and how much opportunity there is to really impact people's lives, uh, people's livelihoods and really, uh, the way that we we move and receive goods and everything uh, uh, in the world today. So that that was what really inspired me to get involved here with uh, autonomous sensing. Thanks, Nathan. Uh, Antonio, how about you? Yeah, well, obviously, uh, I'm interested in general aspects and the markets where safety is involved. Uh, I got involved with autonomous driving first when um, in the 
in, in the International Standard Committee, which I'm lucky to be part of representing the UK, we started discussing, okay, what, what are the peculiarity of the autonomous driving um, technology that we have ahead of us? Uh, what, what should we change in the way safety is adopted in standards and such? And you know, and that opened an old Pandora base. All sorts of complexity and problems came up, and and how and it's fascinating how it, it goes across different domains. So it's not the, the pure technical domain, you know, where you can fix stuff with your technology. It goes it across it crosses boundaries and it goes into a, a, you know the domain of society ethics and 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 whatnot. So I think that that got me very very much interested in that, and and also. I would say uh, coming also from uh, aerospace and uh, having worked on autopilot for helicopters and stuff, um, I do see uh, I do see you know uh, how as as Nathan said, few things there in automotive are, are pretty uh, new where we can actually leverage some experience from aerospace. At the same time, there is also uh, all sorts of challenges in automotive where you have things like you know very limited amount of power that you can use, very limited amount of space. And, um, and I'm actually lucky to work for a company that will hopefully enable all of, you know, all of that stuff to, to be uh, deployed uh, in a realistic way. And if Great, I can add thanks. one thing, yeah. I, I think one of the really interesting things that's, that's sort of happened over the last five years is that we've gone from a domain where it's really a science, academic, interesting, uh, Cruz will tell you otherwise, but like uh, it's it's this question of how do we do the ML? How do we understand what the world looks like? To how do we launch a, a product? And what we're seeing today is you know coming together of all these different disciplines where um, you know there's there's a lot of really interesting stuff that's happened in the military domain for a long time around safety, around um, the development of things like radar that's much more advanced than an automotive radar. Um, and then um, the actual processes to, to launch something that's as complex as, um, you know, a self-driving vehicle um, or other, of course, other domains too. Okay, great. Okay, um, I have a general question for you guys. Uh, you know, the value chain for internal combustion engine personal owned vehicle is dramatically different from, you know, autonomous electric vehicle. Could one of you explain the fundamental differences between in the hardware and software of an autonomous vehicle um, compared to a Chevy, for example. Compared to, sorry, you said a, a Chevy. To a Chevy, to a, yeah. Yeah, I mean, the, hardware. It, Chevy <laughs> makes autonomous vehicles. You have Chevy Cruze, right? So <laughs> that is, yeah. It, I mean, compared to your, your sort of typical car, uh, like if we think of, I don't know, the car that you can go buy off the lot right now at the lower yes. end. You know the the things that they're computing are 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 quick. They're pretty deterministic, um, and and the compute level is very low. That you know, I think at one point Uber was using eight kilowatts of power to run their their compute, and so that gives you a sense, you know, versus probably a hundred watts on a on a regular car. Um, and then one of the big things that we're looking at is introducing machine learning into uh, into these safety systems and these questions around. Um, how do you make that reliable? How do you guarantee that it's actually working the way that you think it's working um, and particularly handling the complexity of the, of the environment? And, and so what that does to the architecture is really add a lot of complexity that you then need to go prove out. Um, okay. one, one thing, if I can kind of tee off what Kevin said, uh, autonomous vehicles are kind of taking a top-down approach. They're saying, you know, let's put 20 sensors on this vehicle, so many radars, so many LIDARs, so many cameras. I don't recall how many you have in your exact stack, Kevin, you probably, more yeah, than that. I mean, yeah, it's, it's more than that, right? Yeah. Um, and, and they're kind of like architecting it in terms of, you know, from day one, how do we make this thing drive itself versus what's happening with conventional cars is it's kind of creeping in the other direction in the form of additional safety features called ADAS, which is uh, automated driving assistance system. So you're seeing the addition of, you know, like cameras uh, that are built by companies like Mobileye that have machine learning that do things like automated emergency braking. So they can tell that a car is you know, you're, you're approaching somebody rapidly and automatically applying the brake or providing warning signals to the driver, sort of what's called level one autonomy, where it's like, okay, you know, like when, when my wife's minivan is backing out of the driveway, you know, it can see that another car is coming crossways with its ultrasonic sensors and, and kind of stop it, right? And, and so you're seeing kind of this, this intersection where uh, the regular cars are having more sensors and more autonomy kind of gradually added one at a time as features, 
versus the full autonomous vehicles where it's sort of top down and everything's built to be kind of exquisite from day one. And it's important to understand the distinction between those two markets. And then the other factor that you have kind of going crossways, uh, which is really commercializing first, is the uh, trucking, mining, logistics, uh, where they really have a legitimate pain point uh, that they're trying to solve using autonomy because there's a driver shortage or in the cases of like mining and construction and stuff, they kill people with these vehicles and they, they have a legitimate like need to uh, increase workplace safety because it's at unacceptable levels right now. So there is one really, I think, important differentiation between those two levels. Um, and and it, you see it uh, sort of play out in the, in the architecture of the vehicles. So if you're coming from, I have a driver behind the seat, I'm going to keep that driver a little more safe than they would have been. Um, you can accept a lot of misses. You, you don't have to see everything around you. And so you see very simple sensing architectures that are, uh, you know, easier to prove. Um, uh, just camera, just, just radar, camera plus radar. I think uh, Subaru has like a stereo camera in it. Um, when you come at it from the other direction of I don't have anybody in the car and, um, or I don't have anybody in that mining truck, uh, the, the rigor that you need to apply and the, the sort of knowledge that, that you need around the vehicle becomes much, much higher. And so that's where you see the, these very complicated architectures because they're handling a lot more. Yeah, so I think I jumping into, sorry, go ahead, Antonio. I was just gonna say that I agree. I mean, one, one thing is the sheer amount of more software that would be written for, for, for enabling autonomous cars, but, this, but also it's not just the amount of software, but the kind of software would be written. Right? In autonomous driving, it would be enabled where, where we, the software techniques that were not used in automotive so far, you know, cloud native software, open source, uh, you know, obviously a, a, AI, and, and all of that would be mixed together from who, you know, and it's not going to be only one source of, you know, writing the software for the whole stack. It would be, a, a, as usual, a heterogeneous um, set of inputs that would be conglomerated together. So and that's very different from what uh, an normal car would, would be. So doubling down on that, um, can one of you explain what that software stack looks like? So from the sensor, sensor data to perception, to prediction, to motion playing, like what is the layer cake of stuff that we actually need to do that's taking all of that energy that, that Nathan outlined? Yeah, you listened to a lot of it. Um, you, you know, so so we start from from sensors. You've got a lot of sensors on the vehicle, so uh, you take the data and you might have an early processing on that on that um, sensor system sensor system on a specific sensor stream. You need to fuse that together. So if you've got a radar and you have a camera, those are different modalities. You need to reason about how to combine those. Um, so there's a big chunk that reasons about that kind of thing. Uh, we take the sort of object layer information that comes out of that system, and we start to reason about um, the semantics of, of a scene. So am I in a construction zone? Am I around somebody that uh, we really care about, a pedestrian? Um, uh, 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 what does the scene look like? Where is the road? Um, you take that uh, and then you need to think about what happens next. So I'm driving on the road. I'm driving in a construction zone. Is somebody going to step out in front of the vehicle? Is there a bike near me that I need to think about? That's prediction. Um, uh, then, then the planner comes in. And so given what the world looks like in a few steps, now you can make a trajectory. Um, so that's, that's sort of the basic stack. There's also localization in there. Um, uh, when you, when you take a step back from that, there's also things like uh, fallback and safety where we need to know if one of those sensors fails, uh, if you lose a tire, um, what happens, right? And so there's a whole series of things that happen downstream of that, um, those pieces typically need to be real time. And so one of the architectural questions is, is where do you split between like a hard real time uh, lower level and, uh, and a level that can uh, have a little bit of jitter. And, and the other thing that I would say to you, there's, there's the dynamic scene and then there's the static scene, right? So the dynamic scene, you're looking for stuff that's moving around that could potentially get in the path of the vehicle, but simultaneous localization and mapping or slam processing is another thing to understand where the vehicle is relative to the scene, which is evolving and like a lot of effort. I mean, there's entire startups that all they do is high definition mapping for other startups to utilize the data uh, to better localize themselves as, as they're driving autonomous vehicles down the road. So um, that's kind of another thing to kind of keep in mind is, is they're kind of almost treated as two separate disciplines, but they're very tightly coupled when you look at like what the actual sensors are doing. 
Yeah, and in all of this is depending on the architecture, then you have different way of establishing safety. So you might have, for example, different redundant channels doing the same stuff and then compare results at the end. Or you can have a, you know, a monitor that instead of working on machine learning based algorithm, he actually works on conventional um, software, checking critical parameters like set distance and stuff, and, and can therefore intervene if, if it detects there's a, there's a misbehavior. And at the same time, if you're relying on the infrastructure, for example, then there's also the security layer to make sure that you're not being lied to. And, and all of that, as Kevin said, they all needs to work in, in real time, in parallel, making sure that you know, you, you, it's, you know, it's uh, reactive. The security uh, so, layers can be understated, by the way. Like, there's actually, if you go, if you go read like uh, dark territory and stuff, there's actual cases where people have hacked cars on the roads and stuff. It's it's no joke. And when you start talking about autonomy, it's a real concern. It is. So what I'm hearing is that this is pretty simple stuff, um, not complicated at all. So um, un unfortunately, we don't have a a panelist from from Tesla here to defend themselves, um, but there are all cameras all the time. Um, in terms of uh, thinking about sensors, some people are going with fewer sensors and we're going to like put a lot on the compute to kind of like take that information, and digest it. Other folks are just like the more LIDAR, the better, and just they don't want all of it. Um, so it looks like a whole kit on top of the car. Um, where, where are we there? Are we, do we kind of understand where we're going to fall in? What are your opinions on like on how, how that how that goes? I mean, I think the basic answer is if Tesla had something that worked, you'd have it, uh, right? So at, with, without somebody in the seat. So I think that tells you where the state of uh, just camera is. It's obviously advancing rapidly, um, but uh, you know, that, that's certainly my opinion. You know, other, other people may have different opinions about cameras, but at the end of the day, you do see failures of those, of those systems that, that really, um, you know, there's a reason that they say that you should have your hands on the wheel. Um, and that's because there are failure modes of those systems that are that are really challenging to handle without actual geometry. Um, that's developing rapidly, you know. Uh, the the our ability to run ML, learn what the world looks like, actually produce a depth image from a few cameras has advanced dramatically in the past few years. And yeah. so I think we're going to see that shift over time. But I think the thing that really sets the bar here is that the average human driver gets in an accident like once every 200,000 miles. It's kind of the, the metric. And if you're talking about somebody who's a licensed driver, like a truck driver, a chauffeur or something, it's more like once every two to four million miles that they get in an accident. And our expectation is that autonomous vehicles should be more reliable than a, than a regular chauffeur because they're not putting on their makeup, they're not eating, they're not checking their cell phone, et cetera. And so it sets a very high bar for reliability, five or six, six nines. You know, I think five nines is pretty common. Uh, we, you know, and, and so what you see with the all camera solution, I mean, you have two cameras here on your face, right? And they don't work reliably all the time, even when you keep your eyes on the road. So adding those extra sensors is primarily meant to add redundancy. And there's there's industry standards like ISO 26262 and you know others that kind of handle that need for redundancy in your sensing uh, that, that, that people, that, that autonomous vehicles need to have. Now, the issue with the camera only approach poor depth resolution, right? And so that's where LIDAR and, uh, you know, radar, which is our, our domain of expertise, can really help out there uh, is, is by providing uh, not just the depth perception, but also the ability to act in all weather because, you know, if it's raining, if it's foggy, if it's cloudy, the cameras don't always work perfectly. They get contamination. The, the big one that everyone deals with is when you're driving into the sun and there's glint. Right. And so having multiple sensor modalities allows you to get around that and really make the vehicle more robust and more reliable. Exactly. I mean, eventually yeah, go ahead. having having diverse, diverse sensors and input would allow for you know, a better availability, better, better safety. It would eventually also allow to widen the, the so-called ODD, which is you know the, the scope in which autonomy is, uh, is deployed and will also allow to have less of the so-called uh, black swans, black swans being the, uh, those events that uh, have not been thought of and therefore the autonomous system has not been system, um, tested against. Uh, they are commonly found sometimes when you drive in real life. I, I think it's important to note that there, you know that there are different domains. There's a spectrum of applications and 
uh, there are ones where it, uh, it, you know, you can have somebody watching remotely or um, uh, somebody actually driving the vehicle and a camera radar system really improves the experience. Um, and then there are ones where, you know, you really need that, that extra level of complexity. And so one of the interesting questions right now is how do you, how do you go launch with somebody really out of the seat in, in, a, um, uh, in a very complex domain? But if you, if you sort of step down that domain, there are lots and lots of applications where, where um, uh, the spectrum of technology fits. Okay, great. Um, a question that I have for you guys is, you know, we know there are different uh, self-driving technologies developers like Cruise, we have Waymo today, Kevin, Zusk, Tesla. So are there any major philosophical approaches, differences and design differences or not? Or are all pretty much the same with the hardware and each of each developer just develop its custom software? Tell us more about this, this topic. Yeah, I mean, I, I think you see um, there's two big camps, right? There's There's sort of the camera only or camera radar camp. Right. Um, and then there's, um, uh, do you use LIDAR? And, and I think they break into sort of like cost, cost regimes. Um, so if I'm buying a car, I don't wanna pay as much as the car to have my sensor set on the vehicle, right? Uh, or right. if your parents are, are buying a car, they're probably not gonna do that. Um, uh, so, so that sets you up for a different regime. Um, that's typically camera radar. Um, and you can get a lot of, a lot of mileage out of that. Um, uh, the other extreme is things like trucking, things like construction, where, uh, the operational costs are higher. And so you can afford, um, uh, you can afford more, uh, capability. The taxi domain, um, looks like that as well. Um, yeah. One of the issues, and this is kind of lessons learned from aerospace is that sometimes more isn't necessarily better. Sometimes having more sensors means more conflicts on what's actually there and what isn't because right. with sensors come false alarms and different types of sensors have different types of false alarms. I mean, LIDAR in particular, you know, you can get condensation coming out of somebody's uh, uh, tailpipe that'll pick up as a, as a ghost uh, on, on some LIDAR systems um, on a cold day, for example. So, uh, you know, less isn't necessarily more and particularly when you're talking about or Sometimes less is more, particularly when you're talking about uh, like edge processing cases, like you're by default in a in a um, uh, autonomous vehicle. Uh, you know, I, I saw an article today where they're estimating that the average autonomous vehicle is going to have two petabytes of data per day that's going to be downloaded. And and when you scale that to fleet, yeah, Ke Kevin's nodding because yeah, that sounds about right. Uh, <laughs> when when you scale that to hundreds of millions of vehicles, there's not enough storage in any cloud anywhere to do that, right? So at some point we have to start thinking about how do we make these pipes a little thinner and how do we start conveying actionable intelligence or information rather than just overwhelming people with raw data. And when you talk to a lot of the autonomous vehicle uh, providers and say, hey, get real with me, they say, yeah, no, we, you know, we're downloading all this data but we really only use it if there's a failure. Right. So the, the, the question becomes, how do we make sensors and, 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 and systems that are able to do more with less to use less power and to frankly respond faster? Because I'm not going to put Kevin on the spot here in terms of anything proprietary about like guidance constants or anything. But a lot of these systems take the better part of a second, if not more, to react. They, a lot of the autonomous vehicles out there react slower than a human would in the same situation if they were paying attention. And so by reducing the amount of data that the perception stack and everything else is having to go through, we can help adjust that rather than just relying on Moore's law to kind of carry us across the finish line. Yeah, and that was one of the questions we got was about that trade-off between system complexity and system reliability, because there will be there will be a trade-off with that, and, and, and thanks for covering that. Um, so... Talking about all this complexity, all the sensors, kind of all this evolution, I remember when I got interested in autonomy about five years ago, everyone thought it was like 18 months away. And it was 18 months away for like years. Um, expectations have cooled a little bit. Um, and timelines have, have increased to something a, a little bit more realistic, where this is a really complicated problem. We might get to 99%, but man, that last 1% is going to take a long time because humans hate it when robots kill humans. 
we're much better with humans killing humans. Robots killing humans is like not something that really compute. So in your opinions, what is this kind of new, new timeline, number one, for like that full autonomy, you know, my kids are getting dropped off at soccer practice uh, by a robot. Um, and what business models are, are, are kind of closer to, 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 to being realistic versus like that, that uh, end target? Mm. From what I can see, I think in terms of computing performance that at the moment are expected to be needed to deploy autonomous, um, the, you know, the, the CPUs that will be able to handle such a workload are probably in design right now, which means we'll probably be in cars no less than five years from now. Um, and this is just you know, from a hardware perspective, then you need to put together legislation, regulations and stuff and, uh, and everything else. I don't know my personal opinion, I think it would be, it would take the, a good part of the next decade to, you know, to actually deploy autonomy at scale. So by the end of you know, the, the 2020s, I think I'm, my opinion is we, we should be able to see uh, autonomy at scale deployed. Yeah, um, we're, we're gonna be much faster than that. Um, of course. Yeah. Of course you would say that, Kevin. Of course you would say that. <laughs> yeah. uh, well, so so first of all, um, in Phoenix, we're we're um, we're already doing taxi rides fully autonomously. Um, so uh, I don't know. We haven't maybe talked about this as a company as much as like when I joined, I was a little bit surprised at, at the scale of that. Um, it's really happening. Um, the cars really drive every day, um, and. Uh, the, the question, the question isn't, is it here? It's how much is it here and, and how do you scale it? Um, and I think a lot of people will, you know, a lot of other companies will sort of ask these questions. When is it going to launch? Um, the question is, how do you roll it out? How do you, you know, there is this complexity question. I think Dwayne asked about, uh, how do you deal with, uh, uh, the expanding, um, uh, scope of all these sensors, you know, what happens if something fails and that affects the ODD. Uh, so, uh, there are really complex scenarios and then there's really straightforward scenarios. Um, if you're driving on the highway, it's actually fairly straightforward driving most of the time. Um, if you're driving in downtown San Francisco, it's pretty complex. And so um, the, the question is, how do you scale that as a business and, and roll it out? And um, so there's varying degrees of answers, but, but really it's here now. And the question is, how do we manage the complexity? How do we grow it over time? And, and, and um, also, how do we make a business out of it? So, so whenever I, I always go back to who has the most acute pain point at this moment in time, they're going to be the ones that are the hungriest for a solution. And the, the commercialization is going to happen first in trucking, mining, construction, and logistics. And we're already seeing it. You know, Caterpillar is doing pilots up at mines in, in, in Canada. And, and there's, there's Pronto and Yamano and others that are adopting it in the mining space, uh, the trucks. I mean, I know Waymo has a very robust uh, uh, semi-truck fleet that they're rolling out along with Aurora plus Pony, Too Simple that just went public, you know, and they're, they're using timelines on the order of, I think, 2024, 2025, but they're focused on what's called the virtual rails use case, which is like, like Kevin said, get in one lane, drive straight, don't hit the guy in front of you, you know, much more simple than around town kind of driving, right? But uh, the, I think, look at the pain point, that's going to be who the first adopters are. Yeah, it, and to add to that, Caterpillar has 40 million miles of fully autonomous uh, mine truck driving. I was, I was part of that. Um, uh, really, like more, that's more miles than Waymo has on the road today. Um, and that's as, as a production system. Um, so some of these things are out there. And, um, you know, we don't hear a lot because there's a lot of hype around cars. Um, yeah. But uh, um, it, it really has to do with that complexity. And the reason that mining took off early was Cat made a bet on it. Um, we, we had made a bunch of good technology at CMU. Uh, we helped them out um, and Cat really wanted to get in the game. And uh, at the same time that the operational domain was relatively straightforward, they could um, remotely safe the vehicles. Uh, they can set up networks so they always have communication. They can uh, uh, do things with GPS because they've got controlled roads. And, uh, you know, you look at the, the sort of like far spectrum of what's hard, you know, what's really hard, um, autonomy in the home, right? You hear about these home robots that are driving around and, you know, imagine what some random person has in their house. 
uh, or what, you know, I probably have clothes on the ground behind me. Um, you know, um, that's a really hard situation to, to manage, um, particularly from a provable safety point of view. Um, and, and so the answer is, you know, we're on a spectrum from how, how complex is it, how repeatable is it to, um, uh, uh, to, you know, how far can you go? Yeah, that, that's an important point to make, particularly on the sensor side. A lot of uh, the challenge is, is that we're trying to identify things and help the perception stack with identifying objects early. And in my previous life, like working with fighter jets and stuff, we can identify, you know, you know generically speaking, without getting into anything that will get me into trouble, we can say that's a MiG-29, that's a 737, that's, you know, a, uh, an F-15, just looking through the radar and identifying it. And the reason we're able to do that is because one, we've developed algorithms that can pull out salient features, but two, there's really just not that much of a variety of things. There's a few hundred different things it might be, and you can kind of filter that out by, you know, a Cessna isn't going to be flying 800 miles an hour, right? Um, whereas on, on the road, there's just a lot more weird stuff, you know, that you can run into a car, you know, there's thousands of varieties of cars and then people modify them. You know, you got trucks with stuff hanging out the back, you got animals, you got people, there's just all sorts of off nominal cases in the homes the same way. So it's really a, a, a harder challenge in that respect than some other domains have, have, uh, have solved the problem before have had to deal with. Another interesting domain will be a manufacturing environment, so a manufacturing plant where autonomous robots will coexist with, mm. with people. So it's sort of a smaller scale, you know, some, some manufacturing plants are as, big, are as big as smaller cities. So it will be interesting to see autonomy deployed in those environments as well as a stepping stone towards going uh, to a larger scale. I mean, I, the other dimension is where is the money going? And uh, the reality is a lot of money is going into, into cars. And so, you know, Waymo and Google made a bet about 10 years ago to get into it. So some of it isn't just about the pain point, but where, where is the momentum? Um, and uh, maybe if you went back and rewrote history, you'd, you'd start with trucks. But my, my prediction is that, the, you know, at least for Waymo, the cars and trucks will scale at a similar, similar pace. So, uh, so that, that, that presents an interesting, interesting question, right? Because... Right now, um, you have the traditional OEMs, the Ford, you have uh, Mercedes, uh, Volkswagen, et cetera, and they have kind of their thing. But then you have all of these upstarts that are really controlling the sensor systems, the software stack, and even you know, full stack solutions like, uh, like a Waymo or a Zoox. When the dust settles, what is this value chain going to look like? Because OEMs really are kind of powertrain companies, right? Like they, they, they buy from a bunch of different suppliers and they've been really focused for the last 115 years on the engine, uh, on the transmission and like just making the thing go. That's kind of what they really design. Um, with electrification, that kind of is very different than it was before. And when you add autonomy, autonomy looks more like a Google project than it does a Ford project. So what are your guys' opinion on, on this shakeout uh, of the value chain in, in cars on an industrial level and who are going to be the, the, the big winners and losers? So we think about it in terms of kind of three parties. Uh, there, there's OEMs and the manufacturers of the vehicles. Um, uh, there's the customer, the, the actual operator that um, at least for trucking drives a fleet or you know, in the taxi case, it might be you, somebody that wants to get to work. Um, and then uh, what we build is, is the sort of uh, brains and eyes and, and uh, reasoning that goes on to that machine. And, um, you know, we're pretty vertically integrated. I think not everybody will be. Uh, there will be the Apples and the Microsofts of this space. And so I think you'll see two different um, hypotheses. Vertical integration gives us a lot of control right now because um, uh, we don't know exactly what the sensor performance needs to be. So if we had to rely on automotive radar, traditional automotive radar, you know, if Nathan wasn't developing what he's developing now, um, we uh, wouldn't be able to do the things that we do. Um, uh, likewise, if we had to rely on LIDAR uh, that's out there, we wouldn't be able to do the things that we do. And we wouldn't be able to control the safety and the quality of those, of those sensors. Now, if we look 10 years out, that may all shift, um, or it may be that we maintain, uh, you know, vertical integration just because um, it, it gives us a, a jump on what gets developed. Yeah, so I, I think, Kevin, Kevin, sorry, Gaetano, I didn't mean to step on you there. 
Oh, no, no worries. So the, the follow up there was, so are you, you thinking that basically you have operating systems? So in the future of autonomy, maybe you have like an Apple versus kind of Microsoft and you pick one and one's maybe Google and one, the other one, I don't know, is Amazon or Apple or whatever. And then every car company is subscribing to that kind of technology layer. Um, I think that's a really interesting way to look at it. I, I, I actually think if we look 10, 20 years out, you're going to see something that looks like um, an app ecosystem where, you know, uh, mm. I don't know what it looks like. It's not going to be a phone, right? But there's a piece of hardware and software that does a lot of, maybe it's kind of an operating system. It gives you a lot of information about what's going on in the world. And then, man, there's a lot of things to do. One of the real problems with autonomy right now is scaling into different applications. You think about all the different things a forklift does. You think about all the different things in construction. That's hard, right? And so there's a core here of reasoning about what does the scene look like? Are there people around me? Uh, how fast am I going? Where am I in the world, right? That, that are sort of like fundamental building blocks. And I think that starts to look like an operating system. Uh, now, if you want real scalability across different um, platforms, you, you don't go uh, say, okay, OEMs are irrelevant. What you say is the, the OEMs build a really important part of the system, which is uh, the safety system that underlies how the brakes work, uh, how the steering works. And, uh, you know, as Waymo, we don't want to go invent that for a thousand different types of cars and trucks. And, uh, you know, maybe we get into construction and something. We're not doing that right now, but um, you, <laughs> you know, heard it here uh, first. <laughs> yeah, right. Uh, don't, but don't I guess the, 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 what, there but, will be a shift in differentiating points. So where, you know, where the, the, the differentiation will be. Uh, I think that, that that's for sure. And uh, I think the difference with, you know, with phones and uh, commodities like that is that, you know, everybody uses a phone for what, you know, for what a phone does to some extent, but nobody uses a phone for the sake of using a phone. Whereas I don't, I don't think we can ignore the fact that there are people out there that just love driving cars for the, for the sake of doing it. And they love, you know, choosing the car that fits with their driving styles and whatnot. I don't think that will probably disappear, uh, but it definitely, you know, I think less choice and as mobility as a service scales, scales up to, you know, to, to the world, then there will be a lot and lots of uh, standardization. And though this is something, for example, we, we invest a lot of trying to encourage the, the ecosystem, even vertical integrator to standardize on the non-differentiated pieces of the stack, you know, the hardware, the low level software, where the, the value is not going to be there. Therefore, it will, to save cost. We, what we think is, you know, it's convenient to standardize at those level, and then so that you can focus on on the differentiating parts of of, of the stack. Yeah, I, th I think one company is going to really knock it out of the park, and then they're going to get to be the one that everyone else kind of copies the standards off of. That's kind of what we saw uh, in in aerospace when they introduced open standards and things like that. Is that you know whoever kind of had the popular uh, architecture, like for example, there's the open mission system that's used on a lot of the next generation uh, uh, you know, airborne platforms. Uh, it's primarily inspired by some of Northrop's UAV work and, and some of their work on you know, uh, some of the other systems, uh, some of the manned systems they build. So I, I think you're gonna see something similar happen here. Um, the, the lead systems integrator kind of role, I think is where you're gonna see a lot of the OEMs kind of finding their level because even companies like Magna and now Foxconn are getting into the business of assembling the actual cars. And you can literally go to Magna. I mean, I listened to the CEO give a podcast for NFX or AutoCAD, no, it was AutonoCast a, 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 a few months ago. You know, you can go to them with a car design and say, I want to build 100,000 of this. And they'll say, here you go. And all you're responsible for is the branding and the marketing of that car. They, they will handle the supply chain. They will handle the integration of all the pieces, the sell-off, the testing. And I can see that becoming more of kind of a, a middle of the, uh, uh, the value stream kind of, kind of provider. Uh, and then they're the ones interfacing with the tier two OEMs and stuff. And literally you're just differentiating based upon your brand and your styling. Mm -hmm. um, I, I can see us kind of moving into that model over time. Mm -hmm. and, and I think having a loosely coupled, highly modular uh, uh, being prepared for that kind of a world is probably uh, a smart thing to do as opposed to, you know, thinking you're going to be able to vertically integrate everything. No offense, Kevin. Okay. That's great. <laughs> go, ask, go ask Bill Gates how that worked out. Uh, <laughs> no, I, I, company. 
I really, I, I really think there will be, you know, multiple models. I think um, there's, yeah. there's, um, uh, I really do think it's kind of like the Apple model, the, the and the Microsoft model, um, where uh, some people view it as um, uh, you get breadth by just providing the software, and some people view it like you get real performance out of integrating everything. And uh, those are two very different ways of thinking. Hey, great. Um, can someone quickly explain to us the evolution of autonomy from level two to level five? And is it the same for cars and trucks? Sure. Um, so uh, level two and level three are basically uh, your ADAS systems. Um, uh, level four and level five are where you start to get into uh, sort of what I would call full autonomy. And, yes. um, you know, technically level five is there's no steering wheel in the vehicle, which, um, you know, these levels were defined a little while ago before we sort of understood what the, what the world looks like. Level four is, um, you know, what we're trying to get to um, and what we have on the road uh, in Phoenix. Um, and then, sorry, what was the second part of your question there? Is it the same for trucks and car? For um, trucks? Yeah, it is. It is, right. You can imagine there's an ADAS system uh, emergency braking on a truck right now. Um, it's, it's less common uh, than, than in cars. Um, uh, trucks tip, typically have manual transmissions and things like that that make it harder to integrate. Okay. Um, uh, but then, yeah, for, for the level four, level five systems, we view it as a um, as very similar problem and um, yes. a different, different operational domain. We actually use most of the same hardware as uh, as we do on the cars, and um, that that's you know why we can move quickly in the space. Okay, one thing I will and, just uh, just, just uh, an yeah, interesting ahead. footnote: uh, the mining people actually have a different set of uh, autonomy standards. Uh, the Earth Moving Equipment Safety Roundtable, sort of a mouthful. You know, they actually define nine different levels. The first six are really more kind of process and safety and then the last two the, the last three seven eight nine could kind of be defined as you know detect warn and intervene in terms of how they look at safety cases and they they, they really have their act together in terms of like specifying use cases and everything because you know they're very liable if something goes wrong um so, so there are other competing models and uh you know i i think that you're going to see probably some more detail added looking more at kind of specific feature sets, whether it's automated emergency braking or whatever in the future. Um, we're actually already good. starting, sorry. Uh, we're, we're already starting to see that, right? Like um, uh, some cars are being, uh, this, this is a little bit forward looking, but it's I think coming pretty soon. There are cars that can like get you out of an intersection if you're gonna be T-boned, um, but they don't drive the car generally. Uh, and, okay. and that kind of sits outside of this L1 through L5 world. Yeah, lane keeping is another one like that. Yeah, yeah. I was going to say. I mean, what everybody talks about today is uh, level three, um, uh, level three way, uh, level of automation, where there's there's they still assume that even though the vehicle under certain circumstances can perform the entire the, the driving uh, function, that it is expected that the driver is there ready to take over control in um, you know, under certain circumstances, whether you're getting out of the ODD or whether you need to take control upon a fault. Uh, but that's a, that, that's a very complex situation. And uh, I can see that there's a lot of noise in the internet these days because of the complexity of handling these, ex, you know, these uh, exchange of responsibilities from the car to the driver again, whether the driver is there or is not there, for example. So the importance of driving monitoring system uh, uh, that is, uh, that's going to be a headline for, I think, the next couple of years. Okay, that's great. Um, just last question before we open it up to our audience. Um, when making an investment into this space, what we should do, an investor should look like in a team and where the value chain, uh, where is the greatest opportunity here? On the hardware, on the software, on sensors? So I mean, what do you think are the biggest opportunities? I think radar sensors are a gold mine, but I'm fine. <laughs> of course you do. <laughs> nice. I, okay. I think I think Nathan's actually right. You know, there's um, there's a big gap between what an automotive radar uh, traditionally does and what we need for autonomy. And I, uh, Nathan's addressing a lot of those things. Um, I I think uh, there is space for hardware models and software models. Um, so you know, 
the, the question is where do you land? And if I were investing in the space, um, spent a lot of time sort of thinking about uh, what businesses to, to go after when I was running my company. And um, what I look for is three things. Um, uh, replicability of the, the operation. So can you, can you take the software that you wrote once and go do it over and over again? Um, uh, what's the operations cost outside of the hardware for that, for that operation? So something like uh, meal delivery, food delivery. Wow. That's hard. Uh, because you know, uh, to make a million bucks, you need to do a million deliveries. That's a hard business. Uh, it's a huge volume business. Uh, you look at something like mining where, um, you know, uh, drivers of mine trucks often get paid a couple hundred thousand dollars a year. Um, and there's several of them, uh, that that's a, that's a much easier space to go say, okay, we're going to add productivity to these trucks. We're going to add value. Um, and, uh, you can work with the drivers and oftentimes, uh, help them out. And, um, and so, uh, you know, questions around driver safety and, and driver comfort become big things once you have the value proposition. Um, uh, and then, and then the third question is how technically hard is it? Um, so, so is this, is this, you know, do we need AGI to go solve the problem or, um, can you, uh, sort of do teleop and augmented teleop and solve the problem? Yeah, I think I, I agree. That's I think great. every, every domain where you can identify a sort of a simpler operational domain. Uh, autonomy will probably thrive in that in, in those domains first, as we said earlier. And I think the other thing that we look for, if I would if I was investing and I need to be convinced, I would I'd like to see a clear uh, a clear strategy for safety and security, obviously, but also a clear path to production. I mean, to, uh, you know, these days is is uh, quite easy to underestimate how difficult it is to move from a, a prototype sort of environment into a production one, uh, because there are things, you know, in the hardware software level gets in the way, you know, moving an entire software stack from a hardware platform to another, depending on the level of stickiness that you get, that, you know, that's quite an investment, it's quite, it's quite a little money. And then the last one for me is in interoperability. Never think that your system will work in isolation. You're going to have to interoperate with, with the environment, with other systems, with other vehicles of different nature. So uh, that's another aspect I will look out for. Okay, that's great. Thank you, guys. Okay, let's open up to questions, Gatano. Yeah, so well, first of all, I think, uh, Nathan, I think Kevin asked for your digits there um, at the beginning of his response. So I'll <laughs> let you guys connect later. Um, so going Just to the ask questions. Matt. Yeah. Just ask Matt from your team. We go way back. Right on. Um, so let me kind of go through these. There's tons of great questions. So yeah. around um, the autonomous trucking piece, um, and maybe this is a larger safety piece, um, how do you project these these trucks will handle things like blowouts, poor loading, uh, you know, uh, things that are kind of specific to the trucking instance um, that has a lot of safety issues? And this this goes a little bit into the the question of functional safety and how do you program these cases um, for protecting the pedestrian, protecting the driver? You know, like there are different things that you can tell the computer to do with different outcomes that does include lives. And so, how do you think through that? Yeah. Um, so a lot of these specific uh, bullets here are really kind of uh, controls and estimation in the in the traditional sense. So things like a, a tire blowout, you can sense by uh, trying to understand the tractive force uh, that you can apply to the road, and you can measure that uh, through you know because we have good pose estimation, because we know how fast the vehicle is going, and how much force we're applying. Um, you, you can measure things like that. Uh, drivers actually listen for it. Uh, we do have microphones on the trucks, um, uh, wow. TBD, how well that works in wind, but, um, we have to handle them. Uh, poor loading is a controls problem and you can imagine, uh, you know, a liquid load, uh, you can have hanging loads, uh, that have a pendulum effect, uh, that's sitting in a trailer. An interesting thing is an, an empty truck in wind, um, uh, uh, versus a full truck drives very differently. And so we have to estimate all of those, all of those parameters. Um, we have a lot of information about the vehicle so we can do it. Um, and we try to handle a lot of these questions operationally uh, wherever possible, because you would really like to prefer um, pre-qualifying a load before you get onto the road. Um, blowout obviously you can't do, but um, uh, 
so, so we try to handle them operationally. You do that because of validation. Um, you don't want to sort of validate every imaginable load. You build an envelope around it like you would in aerospace. And you say, okay, we can handle this kind of load. We can't handle that kind of load. And then you output validate it. So when you go to get on the road, you ask the question, how does this, work? is it, is it within bounds? Um, and so, so those tend to be proprioceptive, you know, what's going on inside the truck. Context. So like the, the, the big challenge that you run into is there's so many edge cases that a computer can't predict for, and we haven't quite figured out the AI yet for the cases that we haven't done machine learning on, you know, that don't look like anything we've seen before. Right. And so the joke we had uh, in, in kind of the machine AI field was, you know, how do you know the difference between machine learning and AI machine learnings written in TensorFlow done in TensorFlow AI is in PowerPoint. And so there is a lot of technological development that needs to occur uh, to handle these kind of extreme off nominal cases. And, you know, the, the Waymo and others are doing a phenomenal job at kind of trying to fill out those cases, uh, but there's so long a way to go. There's a follow-up question that, that, that for, from that, around um, all of these advances that you're talking about in dealing with complex environments, rapid identification of geographic mapping, et cetera, um, what we're learning in, in this kind of huge human pursuit towards autonomy, is it applicable to other, other places and other industries? Like, are you gonna get this kind of explosion of other things that we're gonna do because of all of the investment that has gone into autonomy? Oh, I think we already, I think we already are, you know, yeah. um, you, you, better radars, right? Um, uh, much better compute that, that's super reliable um, uh, for, for these kinds of applications. Um, the machine learning techniques that we're developing, things like reinforcement learning, um, you know, there's companies looking at reinforcement learning that can uh, run in simulation and then you can transfer that over to the real world. You can imagine that has application to manipulation, uh, manufacturing, all sorts of things like that. Um, I think we will see a lot of, a lot of flow down and then um, I, I also believe that what we're really doing is um, amplifying our ability to do work. And so then the question is, you know, like the, the internet and computers organized information and uh, gave us better means to communicate. And then you see a proliferation of applications downstream that you just can't even imagine. Um, if we're amplifying our ability to do work, uh, what happens next? And I think those are gonna be, you know, maybe 10 years out, but huge questions. a good spot okay that's great um all right i think we are on time guys um let's see if we have a one last question um do you think that high bandwidth satellite communication with the with the vehicle will become an important part of of the package down the road um it's hmm. kind of an interesting question uh we don't rely on it right now because it doesn't exist um you know, other than other than sort of like Starlink and things like that, um, uh, I think probably it's a useful tool. Uh, but it's TBD, and we're sort of building. You know, you can't build a safety case around any sort of communication right. link because um, if something happens and your antenna has broken, um, you need to be able to react in in the real world. But I think there's sort of user interface and and questions that happen um, out in the field that that get really interesting once you have more data. Yeah, maybe at a higher level for things like, you know, improving localization or things like that that can occur over seconds, it has a role. But even Starlink, you're looking at a minimum of a 50 millisecond latency that you're introducing uh, to, that, to that decision loop that just slows things down when we're already too slow and need to speed it up. Yeah, so it will be one additional input that you can use to validate other inputs as well, right? Or redundancy. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Wonderful. We are on time, guys. Um, thank you again to all the panelists. It was a pleasure to have you here today. We really enjoyed the discussion. Uh, um, thank you for sharing the ex your expertise and insights with all our community. Uh, thank you to our audience and attendees. Um, in two weeks, Prime Movers Lab will have another webinar. So check out our website, www.primeoverslab.com for more information. Thank you again, everyone, and uh, have a good afternoon. Thanks, guys. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, Thank everybody. you very much. Thank you, guys. Bye.